So, I've been back and forth on whether or not to tell this story, mostly because it involves some aspects of my working life that I am not at liberty to discuss, but also because it had severe personal implications for me. Anyway, I have decided to share it here, and I hope you understand why there are things I simply can't go into detail about. This all started in December 2020. As part of my education, I was scheduled for a six-month internship at a psychiatric hospital. I had previous experience with working with these type of patients, so I was really excited about it. I switched around the four different wards in the hospital, so I treated a lot of different people with lots of different problems. I was curious about all the different aspects, so I never said no to a task, which meant I came across everything from murderers and pedophiles to suicidal teenagers with personality disorders. In my work life, I've had people spit at me, verbally and physically assault me, throw shit at me, and all that stuff. So I like to think I'm a pretty tough guy. And besides that, I always carried a personal assault alarm. One press of a button and staff from every ward would be there in a matter of seconds. On one of the wards, I quickly noticed that there was a certain room which was monitored 24-7 by a guard. To be clear, this is a pretty normal procedure, either because the patient is physically abusive, suicidal, or restrained but most patients get the watch pulled off them relatively quickly. I asked a colleague, and she told me it was a female patient, let's just call her Anne, who was extremely aggressive and psychotic beyond belief. At that point, Anne had been restrained to her bed for three months. I could not believe what I was hearing. We have really strict procedures when it comes to restraining people with belts. By the way, they're soft belts made of fabric, not leather, so... Restraining the patient really is the absolutely last resort we go to. I asked the chief psychiatrist what was up with this girl, and he just scuffed and said, if only I knew, but honestly, she defies logic. He told me that at first they thought she was psychotic, but her symptoms only got worse, no matter how much different medication they tried. Then they thought she might have suffered a trauma and was in a disassociative state but that still didn't fit the profile of her symptoms. She had gone from being a perfectly normal woman in her 20s to being violent, extremely aggressive, and unable to speak in just four months. That is practically unheard of, especially as no drugs was involved. We regularly make a toxicology check of all patients and always when they're admitted. One day, my alarm went off. They're all connected, so I know where I need to run to help my colleagues. I immediately knew it had to be Anne, and I was right. She had only her legs and torso fixated. Again, normal procedure, if the patient otherwise is relatively calm. She had defecated in her hand and thrown it at the guard watching her. She then proceeded to bite her fingers so far that three or four, I can't remember the exact number, had really bad fractures. Both her hands were a bloody mess and she needed like 50 stitches afterwards. It wasn't the blood or the fact that she would throw her own filth at us. I had seen that loads of times, but the screams this woman made, it was the most primal, guttural, and terrifying sounds I have ever heard. It scared me shitless. The best way I can describe it, something like a bear growling and a mountain lion hissing and spitting at the same time. I have seen my fair share of people in primal distress, but I could have never imagined that a person could make sounds like that. As an intern, I am in no way allowed to use force, so I was just watching as seven of my colleagues tried to fixate her fully to her bed. They had serious trouble pinning her down. Remind you, these people are really experienced people. At last, we called a medical alarm which immediately calls for a chief psychiatrist to make decisions. He decided to forcefully medicate her. They gave her one and then a second shot. It only seemed to piss her off, even though it should have put a bear to sleep. At the third injection, she calmed enough so that they could restrain her. She never nodded off. She just breathed heavily and kept staring up the same corner of the room, sometimes smirking at something only she could see. Fast forward two weeks. I was back at the ward. 
It was a relatively calm weekend, so there really wasn't much to do. Anne was in one of her good periods, so she had had her restraints removed. A guard was always by her, though. I was sitting in the office when suddenly I see Anne walking in the hallway without the guard. I don't know if he had taken a bathroom break or whatever, but he wasn't around. So I catched up with her. I asked her what she was doing in the hallway alone, but of course, she didn't respond. I should mention that many of my colleagues were afraid of Anne, and rightfully so. Even though everyone is aware that it's the illness and not the person attacking you, but when it keeps happening, that patient does catch some stigma. I, for one, always try to look at the person and not the illness, so I asked where we were going. She took me by the arm and led me to the common area. She went over to a book cabinet, turned and looked at me, and muttered, Read. Book. I was completely taken aback by the fact that she was speaking. She pulled out a random book and handed it to me. She then sat down on the floor and started rocking back and forth. I joined her on the floor and started reading the book. It was just some random old book, probably from a charity, and it had no special meaning. But as I read, she came closer and closer to me. She then cuddled up to me, put her head on my lap, and fell asleep. One of my colleagues came by and she looked absolutely shocked. And before I knew it, Five or six people, including the chief psychiatrist, was looking at me reading this random book out to her. I caught a lot of praise for this, which is always nice. But then, things took a turn for the worse, for me at least. It started one night when I was home alone. It was a completely normal night for me until I heard something from upstairs coming down the stairs. The best way to describe it is like a big dog thrashing and tumbling down the stairs. You know, like when a dog rushes down the stairs to greet you? But this was bigger. Much bigger. I could hear the weight of something tumbling down while nails or claws or whatever slid on the steps. I got up, thinking that somehow there was a massive animal in my house. But there was nothing there. That scared the ever-living shit out of me. I had never had anything like that happen to me. I left the house and stayed the night with my parents but I also had strange effects on my body. Like I had a filter over my eyes or something. Everything started to seem out of focus, like tunnel vision, but with a massive blur added to it. And then I started to disassociate. I had this feeling of being totally out of contact with my body. Then came the panic attacks. My girlfriend called an ambulance one of the times because I was on the verge of a heart attack. The paramedics said I had a heart rate of 240 BPM. I have had no prior problems with my psyche, but I figured it was stress. I have suffered from sleep paralysis before, but never with hallucinations or whatever you want to call it. But that started recently. I see a large black mass with long arms and legs sit in the top corner of our bedroom, like a massive spider, but just with four legs. This is now happening on a nightly basis. A couple of days ago, I told my girlfriend about it because she kept pestering me with questions about my nightmares. She said, that's funny. Every time you're just about to go to sleep, you look up in that corner and you sort of think. That reminded me of Anne, and now I am absolutely terrified that I might have brought something home. Believe or not, that's up to you. I have never treated a patient like Anne, and none of my colleagues had either. It was scary stuff and I have never suffered any psychological problems before, never. But something is going on, I am sure of it. It feels like it wants to get back at me or something, I don't know. And by the way, Anne is much better today. She is in a rehabilitating home where she thrives. One day, she might even be able to have her normal life back. We all have those calls that haunt us. There's not a 911 dispatcher alive who doesn't have at least one that sticks with them for the rest of their lives. Hell, most have too many to count. I always thought I was above that. I'd never let this job or those calls get to me. I was tough. But then, September 12th happened. I worked the night shift in a very rural sheriff's office. A little over 1,200 square miles with a population of 31,000. Not a lot in the way of heinous crimes happened, 
There were those out of the ordinary UFO calls every now and then, but most of the time, it was loose cows and car deer accidents. We sure do have our share of crazies. And that night, my caller was one of them. It was about 3.01 in the morning. My partner Anna and I were watching reruns of 90 Day Fiancé when the 911 call tones went off. Totally routine. I try to answer the phones faster than Anna because she has the quickest hands in the West when it comes to call taking. And unfortunately, this time, I got it. County 911, what's the address of your emergency? Silence. Hello, County 911. More silence. I look to my call screen where the coordinates are. Updating the call, it finally phases to the correct coordinates to map roughly where the caller is. Hello, County 911. What's your emergency? I repeat again, entering the coordinates in. It maps to a residence in our second largest city. And immediately, I knew who our caller is. Marjorie Cannonberry. Don't let her name fool you. She's not a sweet old lady, but rather a 32-year-old drug user. Extensive history in our in-house records, and I don't even need to look her up. In my three years of dispatching here, I can't recall just one week where I didn't have a call with Marjorie. Hello, Marge. Do you have an emergency? I ask again. We're on first name basis. Yes, I finally hear her whisper. Okay, what's going on? There's... She pauses, her breathing trembling slightly. There's something in my closet. There's someone in your closet? I ask, quickly typing into my call narrative. How do you know they're there? Did you see them? No, not someone, she whispered again. I could tell she was truly terrified. Something... I don't know what it is. Okay, at this point, I'm convinced Marge is having another drug-induced hallucination. It wouldn't be the first time. Describe for me what it looks like. In the background, Anna is dispatching our area deputy. Please send someone, Marge whispered. Yes, I have a deputy on the way, Marge. But I need you to tell me what you're seeing, I said. When you said something, what did you mean? It's tall, she said. It has to bend over to fit, and it has long claws. She paused, and I could hear her sniffing. She was definitely crying. It's tapping them on the floor. Can you hear them? She paused, and I listened carefully to see if I could actually hear anything. Maybe it was my imagination, but I thought, just barely, I could hear a rhythmic tapping. Did you hear them? She asked, almost desperately, like she was begging me to believe her. I ignored her question. What else, Marge? What else do you see? Um, her voice trembled. It's all black and it has really big teeth. It keeps licking its teeth like it wants to eat me. So it knows you're there? Yes, she said shakily. It's staring right at me, glowing yellow eyes. For the first time in my life, a shiver went down my spine from her words. Every horror movie I've ever seen came to mind. Though I knew better, my supernatural bone was beat. Could there really be a demon in her closet? Are you able to leave the room, Marge? I asked, typing all of this into our dispatch narrative. Can you go outside until my deputy gets there to see what's in there? I don't think so, she sobbed. If I move, it'll kill me. Have you been drinking tonight, Marjorie? I know how incriminating it sounded, but it was a legitimate clarifying question. Call me heartless if you want. No, she sobbed again. Please believe me. I know I've done stupid things before. But this is real. I haven't been drinking, and I haven't taken any drugs recently. I don't know what it is, but I'm so scared. It keeps tapping its claws. You have to hear them, don't you? The phone cracked as she held it out at arm's length. There was no mistaking this time. I could hear something tapping. A pit formed in my stomach. What the fuck? It was like the sound of long, acrylic fingernails. Okay, Marge, I'm going to stay on the phone with you until my deputy gets there. I look to our mapping software. He's not super far out, so it shouldn't be too much longer. Okay, thank you, she whispered. It's just staring at me. Does it have a face, I asked, against my better judgment. Did I actually believe there was something there? Yeah, but it's all teeth. Like it's smiling. And it hasn't moved since you saw it. No, it's just there. Staring and tapping its claws. How long has it been there? I don't know. I woke up to the tapping noise and just saw it there. So I called you right away, Marge said. 
You don't believe me, do you? It's not that I don't believe you, Marge, I answered. I've just never heard of this sort of thing before. What you're describing sounds like a demon from a horror film. I think it is. Another shiver. Her voice sounded so convinced. Real or not, she was legitimately seeing something. Whether it was an actual demon or a hallucination, part of me felt bad for her. Being absolutely convinced something like what she described was staring at her, it would be terrifying. Marge suddenly gasped as the phone rustled as it fell from her hands. What's going on, Marge? I asked quickly, my tone dropping in seriousness. It's coming towards me! She screamed. Oh god, it's Claus! Please help me! My deputy is almost there, Marge, I said loudly over her screams, but I doubt she heard me. If I hadn't been freaked out by then, I was now. Those blood-curdling screams were ones of pure and unfiltered terror. It's like I was listening to someone whose life was coming to an end in the most violent way possible. My pulse was flying as I was trying to type everything I heard into the call. Next to me, Anna was relaying the info to our deputy. Come on, I thought. Get there already. The problem with a rural county was that we didn't have as many deputies on as others, so our response time was significantly longer. This particular night, that city's officer had called in sick, so it was the county's job to cover if there were any calls. 1303, be advised. She's screaming and not answering us anymore. Tasha said to our responding deputy. 1303, 104, two minutes out. 1308 to dispatch. I'll be 1076 as well. Our other unit in the area piped up. I had seen him making his way towards the area before, but now he was going emergent. I repeatedly tried to get Marge to come back on the phone, but all I could hear were her screams. I could also hear things being thrown around, like she was smashing into them with her body. And suddenly, as quick as it happened, everything went silent. Marge, I shouted. Marge, are you there? The phone crackled. He's going to kill me, Marge said monotonously. He knows who you are now. You're next. And then the line went dead. If I had a handset phone, it would have fallen out of my hand. How would anyone not get unnerved by something like that? The movie lover in me was terrified. You're next. 1303, dispatch. I'm 1023. The first responding deputy advised he was on scene. His name was Jason, our youngest deputy in the department. A super nice kid who was probably the best person that could respond to help Marge. Anna held radio traffic just for that call, and we waited for what seemed like an eternity as Jason went into the house. 1303 dispatch. It nearly made me jump out of my seat, my nerves on end. Get a med rolling. She's cut up her arms pretty bad. Within five minutes... Our med unit was rolling. Jason and Trevor, his backup, ended up chaptering Marge. They came up before Jason transferred her to the mental hospital. After getting medical clearance and explained everything that happened, apparently Marge was tripping on drugs. My first suspicion had decided to cut her arms with razor blades. She also trashed her apartment in her drug stupor, which would explain the crashing around I heard. But what about the tapping? I asked. I heard the tapping she was talking about. I don't know anything about that, Jason said with a shrug. But it was probably something she was doing that she didn't realize she was doing. Yeah, you're probably right, I said, but I still couldn't shake the bad feeling. It's sad, honestly, Jason said, retrieving the papers off of the printer that he was printing. She's so fried from drugs, she's just crazy now. I glanced out the dispatch window to the lobby, where Trevor was sitting with Marge. She sat with her head hanging down and her arms in bandages. Seeing someone hopped up on drugs was always a little disturbing to me. As if she knew I was looking at her, she lifted her head and her eyes met mine. They grew wide as if she was about to be hit by a bus. And then she pointed at me, letting out another piercing cry. Trevor stood up as she did, putting himself between her and me inadvertently. I couldn't shake the feeling that she was pointing at me, but rather behind me. I told myself it was dumb, but why was it I couldn't look over my shoulder? Jason flew out the door with the paperwork he needed and both struggled down the front with her to load her up in the squad. In two days, hospital staff would find Marge dead in her room. Her head somehow twisted unnaturally around. Her death would never have a full explanation. Finally, after taking a deep breath, I turned around. There was nothing there. 
I let out a breath that I didn't know was holding and then laughed at myself. Of course, there was nothing there. The rest of the shift went by smoothly. The whole 20 minutes we had left. When we finally left that night, I couldn't wait to go home and go to bed. That call had really rattled me and left me with a headache. I got back to my apartment, greeted by my little white cat. After giving her more food, I took off my uniform and hung it up in the closet, making sure to close the doors. Hurrying back to my bed, I jumped in and turned the TV on for background noise. That night, I slept with the lights on. Maybe it was just my imagination running wild or the stress of a long week. But as I closed the door to my closet, I could have sworn there was a pair of glowing yellow eyes staring back at me. I noticed it first on a Monday after an unusually brutal shift at work. Customers hounding me for refills, sauce on the side, extra napkins. You know how it is. That day was especially bad because I had one guy try the dollar bill trick on me. You know the one. He set out five ones and took away a dollar every time I messed up or wasn't fast enough. I wasn't angry at him for taking any away only that he expected me to bend over backwards for five fucking dollars. Get real. After dealing with all of that, the last thing I wanted to see on my way to the front door was a creepy old man staring at me. He had been my duplex neighbor for over five years. Most people wouldn't live in a duplex for so long, but we only shared one wall with each other, and he was always very timid. The only sounds I heard through the wall were his low humming to jazz tunes and the clinking of pots as he cooked. This was his daily routine after spending hours in the garden talking to his flowers. He was a little off, sure, but he was very sweet. He respected my privacy and never approached me aside from the occasional hello. Things changed a lot when his grandson moved in. Of the few conversations we had, he had not once mentioned a family. That's why I thought it was strange to see a chalky, scruffy, 20-something man dragging a suitcase into the unit beside me on a warm Wednesday afternoon. I didn't ask who he was, but when he saw me reclining on my patio chair, he perked up with a, Oh, you must be my new neighbor. My name is Cameron. He told me all about how much he missed his grandfather after so many years and how he was too elderly to be living alone. Something about him seemed, uh, off. I can't describe it, but it wasn't my business, so I brushed it off. Suddenly, I was seeing more and more of Cameron, and less and less of my elderly neighbor. He was no longer spending time in the garden. I could no longer hear the faint jazz through the walls. Instead, I heard whirring of tools every night until 11pm, like a late night remodel was happening next door. Honestly, it was so faint, it never bothered me. At one point, those noises stopped too, and that's when I saw my elderly neighbor again. I stepped out of my car one day and began walking towards my front door when I caught something in the corner of my eye. The sunlight was hitting my neighbor's window at the perfect angle where I could hardly see anything but bright, flooding yellow. I squinted hard to make out the shape. All I could see was a figure standing behind the window, perfectly still. I decided not to dwell on it too much and went inside but something about that sent a chill down my spine and lingered in my thoughts. As I lay in bed, I still couldn't forget about it. The next day, I glanced over at my neighbor's window, but the curtains were drawn. Well, maybe it was my imagination. So I went off to work like usual. Once I came home, he was standing there, staring, waiting behind his large glass window, his loose, draping skin accentuated by the fact he was completely nude. He stared at me with hazy eyes and a sick expression on his face. It made me gag. I knew he was standing there for me. I had been coming home at the same time every day for years. I remained frozen, unsure of if I should head inside or get in my car and drive somewhere far away. In the end, I decided I may have been overreacting. Cameron had told me a few days prior that the old man was suffering from dementia, which worsened every day. I didn't want to do anything rash, especially since my sweet neighbor was sick. He probably wasn't standing there on purpose. I decided to let it go. 
but days turned into weeks and the old man was waiting by the window every day. Even when I changed shifts, he was always there, waiting. Sometimes he was sitting on his satin chair with a cup of tea, but certain things remained the same, such as his naked, forever drooping skin and his hazy expression. Sometimes it felt like he grinned at me as I walked by. Nights felt uncomfortably cold as his loud breathing echoed through our shared wall. It felt as if he was always watching, even when he wasn't by the window. I never saw him come out of the house. I don't know if he ever left. Only Cameron would leave occasionally to gather groceries and come home whistling tunes on his way in. I tried to avoid looking at the old man as much as possible, but I noticed how sickly he became. Once, I leered a little longer near my door to see if he would turn to watch me leave. That day he was just standing there, unmoving, his skin drooping almost to the floor. I don't know why I knocked on his door. I don't know if I was worried about him or fed up. I just knew I couldn't take much more of the staring. It was driving me crazy. It only took two knocks before Cameron opened the door. Hey, Rye, what can I help you with? He said nonchalantly. Rye. Only my friends call me Rye. Who does this guy think he is calling me that when we've only exchanged a few sentences to each other? That really irritated me and I became a little more aggressive. Can I come in? I need to talk to you. I was unwilling to hide the agitation in my voice. He whistled. Now really isn't the time. Can I invite you over for dinner later? No, we need to talk now. I was beginning to push my way in when I stopped. I saw something in my peripheral that made my stomach turn. I looked up at Cameron, my fearful expression crystal clear in his dilated pupils. His breathing became heavy. He looked excited. He reached out to grab me, but I was too fast. I ran into my unit and tightly locked the door. With trembling fingers, I dialed 911. Thump, thump, thump. Cameron was hitting hard against our shared wall. Come back, let's have dinner. His muffled voice somehow carried into my living room. I tried to keep my composure so I could describe to the 911 operator exactly what I saw at my neighbor's house. Once they informed me the police would arrive in 15 minutes, I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and huddled into a corner of my living room. Cameron was still pounding against the wall, repeating the same five words. After about 10 minutes, he stopped. Silence. Then I heard the creaking of the neighbor's back door. It's funny how many small sounds you can make out when your senses are in survival mode. I sat, praying that he wouldn't try to come into my home. It was dark now, and the silence had filled with the chirping of crickets. My prayers were answered when I saw glaring red and blue lights approach our driveway. Loud knocking nearly made me jump out of my skin. I slowly approached the window and let out a sigh of relief when I saw the cop standing there. I cautiously opened the door. Ma'am, you called about some suspicious activity next door? My neighbor's skin, I whispered. The fear had managed to take my voice away to where I could barely speak. What? The policemen looked at each other in confusion. I pointed at the window attached to my neighbor's unit. Unlike other nights, the curtains were wide open and the silhouette of the old man's draping body stood behind the window. The police scurried over to the neighbor's unit and disappeared behind the door. I watched from the other side of the window as one of the policemen turned my elderly neighbor around. From my view, I could see all of the stitching on his back. A poorly sewn-on zipper adorned the center so that his skin could be worn like a sick, repulsive costume. I couldn't take it anymore. I let out all the vomit I had been holding back up to this point. The police didn't seem too pleased with their discovery either. Cameron, if that even was his real name, was never caught. I described him to the police, but his face was the type that didn't stand out at all. If I were to try and pick him out of a crowd, I'm not confident I could. He wasn't my neighbor's grandson, obviously. Sadly, my neighbor didn't have a family, but he seemed happy by himself up until, you know.
I had seen the old man a few times after Cameron moved in, but he was acting strange. I wish I had paid attention back then. I don't blame myself, but I do feel regret for the way things turned out. One thing's for sure, though. I'm never living so close to a neighbor again. I grew up with parents who were reasonable, loving people, but who were also more than a little paranoid when it came to the internet. Anything that allowed anonymous communication in any form was banned, point blank, from the household. Even Club Penguin wasn't allowed because you could chat in it. Naturally, when I got my first laptop at 12, it was a piece of crap, gotten only because of all my homework that year was online. The first thing I did was start trying to talk to people online. I wasn't going in chat rooms or anything, because my parents' warnings still resonated with me, but I wasn't avoiding contact either. I ended up making a deviant art account, I know, I know, cringe, where I didn't do much posting as I lack artistic talent. In spite of this, however, I was contacted via private message by a guy who I'll call Joker because his profile picture was of the Joker. That should have been a warning sign in and of itself, honestly. Joker just started talking to me out of the blue. I think I'd commented on one of his pieces or something, and he reached out to me to thank me for my kind words. We started talking. It turned out we had a lot of common interests. We played some of the same games, like some of the same cartoons, etc. He seemed like a really, really nice guy. I think it was maybe a week or two and that the first uncomfortable thing happened, even if I didn't exactly think much of it at the time. The two of us shared a somewhat misanthropic view of the world, so there were a lot of dark jokes passed back and forth between us. Sometime about a week after we first started messaging, he casually mentions thinking that the world would be better off without him. I sent him a sad face and assured him that it wouldn't, as I quite liked talking to him. He didn't say anything more about it then, so I assumed that was it. It wasn't. Joker talked about suicide a lot. His talking about it quickly morphed from passing commentary to long, graphic rants about how much he hated himself and wanted to die, and what method would be best for him to do so. I spent hours talking him down over chat, terrified that one day I wouldn't be able to do enough and he'd actually do it. His messages started to get creepy in a different way. He started telling me how grateful he was to have me, how no one had ever cared about him as much as I did, how important I was to him, how he couldn't live without me, how he'd just die if he would ever lose me. He was obsessed. Well, one day, a couple months in, my laptop breaks. It wasn't too bad, but it still took a couple of days before everything was back in working order. I logged back into DeviantArt to find dozens of messages, all from Joker. They started off normal enough, but quickly became frantic after I didn't respond. The last message he had sent was along the lines of, I can't take this anymore, followed by a link to a picture image. The image was a pair of slit wrists. The cuts were deep and fairly fresh looking too with red inflamed edges and the beginnings of an ugly scabbing just beginning to settle over the top. I was horrified. I quickly messaged him back, terrified I'd just lost a friend, and he responded. I thought I'd lost you, he said. I thought you'd left me. I couldn't handle the pain without you. Don't ever do that to me again. I said I wouldn't, and he seemed relieved. He only got worse from then on. It reached a point where practically our every conversation consisted of him either professing his obsession with me, threatening suicide, or both. The stress was keeping me up at night. I was terrified that one day soon I'd open up the chat and see nothing. I was utterly convinced it was my job to keep this guy alive and that I was failing miserably at it. Joker kept escalating until one day, nearly a year in, he finally said something that frightened me so badly I had to leave. Joker started talking about how I was the last good person left on this miserable planet and stuff like that. He waxed poetic about how much he wanted to kill himself and said that he'd finally found a way to truly be happy. He said the only way he'd ever be able to find happiness was in killing himself 
and taking me with him. That way, we would always be together, free from the cruel weight of the world. He started going into very detailed, very graphic descriptions of how he'd kill me. A lot of them involved carving out my heart, then clutching it to his chest and laying beside me as he took his own life too. I was terrified, enough so that I did what I should have done a long time ago and deleted that account. For years following that incident, I never spoke to anyone online. Even to this day, actually, there's still a lingering sense of dread when it comes to online interaction. So, to the boy who I thought was my first internet friend, I don't know what your deal was, whether you were mentally ill or purposely malicious or some combination of the two. But whatever the case may have been, let's not meet. This happened in the summer of 2010, when I was just entering my teenage years. My family took a trip to a really nice hotel in the city. I can't really remember why we decided to take the trip, but I remember a lot of family friends coming with and staying in adjacent rooms. I've never asked my parents, and it's not really important to the story. To preface, I'm a bit of a scaredy cat and always have been. I'm a pretty skinny, fragile kid, so I get spooked pretty easily, even now. This, however, was almost definitely not me freaking myself out like I normally did. Looking back, I'm incredibly lucky I trusted my instincts. This hotel had a strange design to it. The lobby was actually on the fourth floor, not the bottom floor, which I found strange. To access the lobby, you had to use the elevator. There was no way for you to get to it from the stairs. This information would have been nice before everything happened, as you'll find out. The hotel was organized in a square shape. Every floor was lined with a balcony, and you could look down into the lobby and cafe area from your floor. Essentially, if you were walking to your room, you could be seen from anyone that was on your floor if they just stepped out of their room and looked around. I was always afraid I'd fall over the balcony and sail down eight stories to my death but they were high enough to a point where I wasn't too concerned for my safety. The first day or two was nice. My friends and I hung out and played cards all day, or we watched whatever was on TV. At night, we'd explore the halls of the hotel and tell each other ghost stories. It was a really fun time, even though I didn't fully understand why we were there. On the third day, though, things got strange fast. I woke up to the sound of screaming coming from outside my door. Now... Because of the hotel's design I mentioned, sounds from the lobby would echo all the way up to the top of the building. So, when I walked out to investigate, I immediately looked over the balcony to see what the commotion was about. I saw a girl laying on the ground, eggs and milk splattered everywhere around her. People were rushing to help her, and I heard a couple people telling each other to call 911. It seemed like the girl was unconscious, maybe she had passed out or something. I scanned the lobby and saw that my family and a couple of my friends were in the lobby getting breakfast, all staring at the event in front of them. I decided I'd rush down to meet them and find out what had happened. The elevator was on the opposite side of my floor, so I took the stairwell located right next to my room. We were on the 7th or 8th floor, so I knew I only had to take about 4 flights down. Not a big deal. I descended for a little while, looking for the number 4 on the wall or the letter L. I passed floor 5, ready to find a door to the lobby. I took about two more flights of steps before realizing that there hadn't been a door for the fourth floor, nor had there been a door for the third or second. Now, at this point, I probably should have turned back, but I continued down because I was tired and didn't want to climb back up. There were some weird side hallways that went into pitch black areas with a bunch of piping and wiring, and though I was curious to explore, I passed them by. I quickly hit the bottom floor, a dimly lit and cold room with cinder block walls and concrete floors. In front of me was a set of double doors. I hesitated at first, but I assumed that this was just another way back to the lobby, so I opened them and entered. Behind the doors was a massive warehouse-type room, probably the size of a smaller basketball stadium. The only light coming in was from the stairwell behind me, so I really wasn't able to see much. 
Stairs were stacked and covered in plastic wrap. Tables lined the wall, and in the distance I thought I could see boxes stacked and lined against the wall as well. It was probably the storage room for the hotel. I looked around and saw an elevator in the back of the room, so I made my way towards it. I closed the door to the stairwell and began to walk in the dim light. The room was super muggy and dusty, and it seemed like nobody had been down there in a long time. As I got closer to the elevator, I noticed it was a little bigger than the elevators in the lobby and other floors. I pressed the up button, but got no response. There was a card swiper next to the button. Must have been for employees only, I thought. I turned back towards the stairwell doors, making my way past the chairs and tables along the wall. When I got to the door, I gave it a tug. Locked. Of course. This is when things started to hit me, and I realized I was stuck in the dark, dusty basement of a hotel. I didn't have a phone, because my parents wouldn't let me get one until I graduated middle school, so I couldn't call anyone. Everyone likely assumed I was still asleep in the room, so I began to freak out believing that nobody was going to look for me. I searched around the warehouse looking for other ways out. Some areas of the place were better lit than others, so I looked around in areas I could see first before starting on the darker side of the room. There was one other set of doors that I found, but it happened to be locked as well. I began to cry, scared that nobody would ever find me in this basement. I swear it felt like hours, but I think only a handful of minutes passed by before I heard the door creak open. It wasn't the door from the stairwell, rather, the second door I had found. A slim, middle-aged man in a lab coat came out of the doors. Now, if this was 21-year-old me seeing this man, I would be very confused as to why this guy was wearing a lab coat in a hotel. I was only 12 or 13 at the time, so I immediately was relieved at the sight of an adult who looked smart. I approached him, tears in my eyes, and he immediately looked surprised to see me, as you'd expect. What are you doing down here? He yelled. I got lost on my way down to the lobby, and I've been locked in here. Do you have a key? I was shaking, eager to get out of there. He didn't answer my key question, and instead he said, I know a way out of here. Follow me. He began to walk towards the doors with the stairwell, and I followed, relieved that someone had finally come to save me. We approached the doors, and I began to reach for the handle, but he continued walking. Isn't it right here? I asked him. I will never forget the look on his face when I said that. He looked nervous, and though it was dim, I could see sweat glistening from his forehead and behind his glasses. No, this way, he said sternly. I continued to follow him, but I was now nervous myself. We had passed the door to the stairs and were now headed towards a darker side of the basement away from the elevators. He looked like he had no clue where he was taking me as he kept checking around him, almost as if he was taking in his surroundings for the first time. We turned a corner and began walking towards the boxes, a dead end. I immediately froze, realizing that something was very, very wrong. This guy had no idea where he was going, nor did he appear to work at the hotel. I said, my voice shaking, Okay, where are we going? He turned and said, This way, just follow me. I knew that there were no doors by those boxes. I had checked there first after I found out the stairwell door was locked. I want to thank whatever god is up there for gifting me with that idea I had next. I started yelling, as loud as I could. I yelled so loud I gave myself a headache. The man, irritated and plugging his ears, began yelling back at me. What are you doing? Be quiet! I continued to yell. I don't even remember how long I was yelling. Finally, the man snapped and began quickly walking towards me. I went in a full sprint towards the stairwell doors, hoping to God they'd somehow be magically open. He didn't run after me. He walked sternly behind me, muttering things like stupid fucker and other kind compliments. I was about five feet from the door when somebody burst through. My savior, a hotel janitor who had heard the screaming from the stairwell. He saw the situation, me and some random guy in a lab coat in a locked basement, and immediately told me to get behind him. The janitor asked me who the man was. I said I had no idea that he had come in through the door on the other side of the room, and I pointed to the door. The janitor quickly radioed into the desk that he had found a child in the basement, and quietly, so that I wouldn't hear, he said, this man, 
came from outside, get security, or something like that. The man in the lab coat started trying to argue with the janitor, claiming that he simply was looking for a bathroom. The janitor clearly wasn't buying it and kept saying things like, wait till security gets here and talk to them about it. I was standing beside him the whole time, trying to take in what was happening, confused out of my mind. Eventually, an employee from the front desk arrived and took me back up the steps to the lobby where I met with my family, who surprisingly had no idea I was missing. I told them the story, crying and shaking, and they hugged me tightly, thanking the employee over and over for their help. I never got to thank that janitor, though. Looking back now, I have absolutely no clue what that man was doing in the basement. I don't have any information as to what happened afterwards or who he was. I know for a fact that the incident with the girl in the lobby was unrelated, something about low blood sugar, not sure. I've thought about that day a lot and the only explanation I can put together is that the door I had found in the basement leads to the streets of the city where he must have wandered in from. I have no clue what his intentions were, why he was wearing a lab coat, or why he chose to pretend to know a way out. To be frank, this could have just been a huge misunderstanding of some sort and I just chose a really bad time to get lost. But all I know for sure is if I hadn't screamed my lungs out, I might not have been telling this story the same way, or at all. So, strange man in a lab coat wandering around a dark, dusty hotel basement. Let's not meet. This primarily happened to my mom, but this has badly affected me mentally too with worry. She wanted me to post this just to give people a heads up that you can encounter creeps literally anywhere. This is going to be long-winded, sorry, but I just wanted to get in every detail possible. This happened last month, and we still don't actually know what happened with Jeremy in the end. I'm a 19-year-old female who is studying in a university in England. Entering my second year last month, we decided to stay in my university town the day before I was due to move in my student home so I could get there early and move my stuff in and give me the rest of the day to relax before we started Freshers Week. The night before moving day, me and my mother stayed in a hotel located in my university town. We were greeted by a very friendly man called Jeremy. Jeremy was very attentive and showed us to our room and stayed around 10 minutes telling us the history of the hotel and repeatedly asked us if we needed help unpacking and stuff, which we kindly rejected. It was a Friday, so me and my mother went around the town and had a few drinks. Nothing too heavy as Freshers Week started the next day, so I wanted to be fresh for the Saturday night. Before going out, Jeremy explained that he never works weekends, so he told us to have a good night and wished me luck with the rest of my university journey. He gave me a hug and gave my mother a hug and a slight kiss whilst moving his hand down towards her bum, which she found weird but brushed it off as nothing. My mom is 37 but looks young for her age and Jeremy is easily in his 40s, so we just thought Jeremy may have fancied his chances with her. Moving on, me and my mom have a great night around the town and watch a couple of live bands and have a few wines, so we were a little on the tipsy side. We get back to the hotel and the bar is still open, so we decide to have a nightcap. Whilst we are having a drink in the bar, Jeremy emerges from a back room and spots us and makes a couple of jokes. Jeremy then proceeds to watch a video on his phone on full volume of a woman screaming at the top of her lungs as if she was being murdered. The screaming was blood curling and made me and my mum unsettled and also another couple in the bar looked a little concerned as well. The video went on for three to four minutes before Jeremy laughed and went into the back. When we make our way to bed, my mum had taken her shoes off after they had become painful after dancing in the bars earlier. Jeremy emerges from the back room and puts his arm around my mum and says, Oh, let me help you to your room, honey. You must be wasted after all that drinking. My mum isn't actually that drunk and insists she is fine, but Jeremy persists and basically follows us to our room and proceeds to come in but I bid him goodnight and closed the door pretty much in his face before locking it. The next morning, we are up early and make our way down for breakfast. The young girl working takes our breakfast order, only for Jeremy to bring them out, insisting the eggs cooked to perfection, although he claimed he never worked weekends. 
Me and my mum are weirded out by Jeremy at this stage and check out straight after breakfast. Jeremy sees us out and says these exact words. I'll be seeing you very soon, Christy. Anyway, at the time it doesn't strike us as unusual and my mum drives us to my new home and helps me unpack and stuff. She helps me to unpack and then leaves in the early afternoon as she had to work that evening in our local bar. The rest of the day goes by without much going on, but that night I'm out drinking with my housemates and I get a call from my mum saying that Jeremy had just come into the bar where she works. This is no coincidence as when we were having our nightcap, Jeremy would have heard us talking about the bar where my mum works and he also had our address which needed to be provided at the hotel for whatever reason. He had also said to my mum when she was pouring his pint that she should go round to his friend's house after her shift which was just around the corner. This call really scared the shit out of me. About a half hour later, my mum called me and said that Jeremy had left the bar after she rejected his offer to go to his friend's house later, but Jeremy had said he'd be back for her later. This was really worrying and I told her to make sure a customer was with her as she was locking up on her own on that evening. After this call, I felt sick and didn't join my friends in going to the nightclubs. In the meantime, I called my dad, who no longer speaks to my mom. They aren't on bad terms, they just choose not to keep in contact with each other after they split a few years ago. My dad is a club bouncer, but he wasn't on duty that night, but I called him and begged him just to drive down there and make sure everything was okay. My dad clearly knew by my shaky voice that I was panicked, scared, and helpless. 1am rolled around and I didn't get a response from either my mom or my dad's phone. I was worried sick and hoped that Jeremy hadn't been waiting round a corner and done something to my mum when she was locking up. At 1.30am, my mum finally rang me in hysterics. As she had been locking up, Jeremy had pulled up in a car with three other men and shouted at her to get in the car for a ride. My mum declined his advances and he got out of the car and approached her and told her that he won't tell her again. He said she had been flirting and teasing him ever since she checked in last night. She told Jeremy that is complete bullshit and she wasn't at all into him. As Jeremy got closer to her, she could smell heavy liquor. As Jeremy went to grab my mum, my dad pulls up behind the car and beeps his horn. This causes Jeremy to go back to the car and climb back in and tells my mum that he knows where she lives and he'll be waiting. The car screeches off. My dad then gets out of his car and tells her that I had told him to check on her. Scared to go home alone, she asked my dad to drop her off at my grandmother's as she didn't want to be alone. After that night, we never saw Jeremy again, but my mum did make a report to the police about him and gave them a full account of what happened, but she hasn't heard back from them. I'm just so relieved that my dad turned up to the pub when he did as Jeremy would have easily been able to get my mum into that car as she is only very small in stature, 5 foot 2 and around 120 pounds. I just hope that scumbag got what was coming to him and is behind bars. My mum has been pretty badly affected by this and is only now comfortable being alone in her house. So Jeremy, I hope you rot in hell and let's never, ever meet again. My name is John J. Gorderi. I'm 26 years old and I work at a previously local coffee shop. I say previously local because I don't think I'm anywhere close to that place. Let me start from the beginning. I was working as a cashier that day and taking orders when I saw a person across the street. I didn't think anything of it till hours later when we had little activity and I saw that they were still there. Out of curiosity, I asked the other cashier if he saw the person as well. As they turned up to look at them, they looked confused. Weren't they standing there like three hours ago? He asked. I replied with a shrug and told him that I was going to check on them. As I headed out the door, I turned around to see most of my co-workers gathering behind the counter. I turned back and took a long look at them. They were wearing a black trench coat a pair of dirty sneakers, and a baseball cap that looked like he had sat on his head his entire life. Hey guy, are you all good? You've been standing there for hours now, I called out to him from across the street. He didn't move or show any signs of hearing me. Hesitantly, I walked across the street, and at this moment I know why my parents told me to look both ways before crossing the street, because at that moment I was struck by a semi going well over the speed limit. I don't remember much of that, 
but what I do remember is that I didn't feel a thing and the strange man lifted his head slightly and I saw a ghostly <laughs> white face and the smile of a man who has no sympathy left. I remember hearing the sounds of my co-workers gathering around me. One of them was calling the police and for a short while I could open my eyes. I saw the blood starting to pool around me and people standing over me, but the thing I remembered the most clearly was the other cashier was looking around, and I didn't realize this till later, but he was looking for the guy, which implies he either ran or disappeared. I woke up later in a hospital room surrounded by all sorts of equipment and many tubes running from my body. I took a good long look at myself. My right arm and leg were both broken and strung up from the roof. I tried to move my head, but pain shot through my body like electricity. My neck was in a brace, but I could still barely move it, but it still hurt to move it, so I just moved my eyes and not my head. I looked forward and saw a few x-rays, but they were pictures of a leg, a neck, and I think the last one was an arm, but it looked like a glass table that had been in an earthquake. As an educated guess, I think they were my x-rays. My leg was broken right at the place where it meets the hip, and my neck wasn't broken, but from what I could tell, something wasn't right. I tried to call out for any nurses or a doctor, but I couldn't produce any sounds. It's a strange feeling when your brain tells you to do something, but you can't. It gives you this feeling of confusion and fear. After this whole ordeal with not being able to yell, I remembered that hospitals have a button to call a nurse. I used my left hand to feel for it, and I didn't find one, but either way, I heard the door to the right open. Something about the footsteps didn't sound right. They sounded uneven or out of time. I don't remember. Whoever they were walked over to my bed and started fiddling with the equipment next to me, and for some reason, I didn't alert them I was awake, but as they were leaving, I must have pushed the button off the bed somehow, because next thing I know, there's a clatter on the wall and whoever was in my room shambled over to the wall, never looking at me, and picked up the button and set it back on my bed. They started to walk over to the door, but they stopped at the foot of the bed, and for some reason I closed my eyes like I was sleeping, but opened my left eye just enough to see out of it. The nurse turned to face me, or at least turned her head to me because she had no face. Out of fear for what would happen to me if I did anything, I just sat in the bed and watched as she walked to the door and out into the hall. After a long time, I finally relaxed. Then I started to realize the true scale of my danger and I let out a silent scream. I will spare you the day to day, but after a week or so of the faceless nurses, I became desensitized to it and I just waited for the nurses to leave my room. They removed my neck brace after a month or so, and I heard from just outside my door some muttering that didn't even sound like a language, but I could make out one word, miraculous, which was probably referring to my recovery. Not long after, they removed my neck brace, and did they remove my leg cast. I think after a year in the hospital, I finally worked up the courage to yell out to the nurses, but no one came. Then I tried the button, but again, no luck. After that, I realized they don't come when called, they come when they want to. At that, I moved my right arm with my left, which hurt to high hell, but I had to. I threw my legs over the bed and pushed myself up, but instantly I fell to the ground, which I probably should have expected after sitting in a bed for a year and then some. I pulled myself up with all my might and threw myself back into bed, and for the next three months or so, I threw myself out of bed trying to build my strength, and eventually I did. I taught myself how to walk again. Slowly, I would make my way to the door and then walk back. One day, I tried the doorknob, only to find that it was locked. Each day, I tried to open that damn door, but nothing would come of it. I eventually was able to run and walk like I was before the truck. I had the great idea one day to use the bed as a ram against the door. I grabbed the foot of the bed and pulled it forward. It slid with ease, and as I twisted, I started pushing it at the door with great speed, and within seconds, I slammed into the head of the bed as it slammed into the door. I pulled it back to the wall again and tried again, but still nothing came of it. I tried for days, but then I had a great thought. What if I push the bed at the door when the nurse opens the door? And that's what I did. I waited. 
She didn't come for weeks, but when she opened that door, I was ready, and I pushed off the wall and slid at the door and slammed into the nurse. And just before I went through the door, I jumped off the bed and started running down the hall. As I ran, I heard a shrill shriek from behind me, and I turned to see what happened. Apparently, those things are incredibly fragile, because when I looked at it, it was bleeding this purple liquid from where I had hit it with the bed. It collapsed to the ground with a dull thud. I continued to run without stopping, and as I ran through the halls, the nurses didn't try to touch me. They just kept moving on with their day. As I ran, the walls and rooms became more and more run down and decrepit. As I ran past these destroyed rooms, I saw those things forming from the walls, and these ones were aggressive, but at least, for this part, they only came from the rooms. When I made it to the first floor, the hospital was practically collapsing. This floor, the nurses didn't only come from the rooms, they came from everywhere. I started running down the hallway, but as I did, so did the arms and tried to scratch and claw at me. Some of them even got me, but I was running so fast they couldn't get a good grip on me. I ran past the reception desk and through the doors, and when I made it outside, there was nothing. As far as I could tell, the hospital was the only thing that existed there. I didn't care, though, because I just ran and ran and ran without stopping. I made it so far that I could just barely make out the outline of the hospital in the distance. I sat down in the empty field and eventually fell asleep or passed out. It was one of those two. I eventually woke up in the one place I didn't want to, the same hospital I first woke up in. Somehow I knew I wasn't home. I looked around the room trying to get my vision to focus. As I was doing this, I noticed a person sitting in the chair next to my bed. I still couldn't see, but I could make out a baseball hat, a dirty black coat, and a pair of dirty sneakers. I slowly looked up to his face, and I didn't need my vision to focus to know who was sitting next to me. For context, I was 22 years old, a female, and a senior in college. During my senior year in college, I was following a particular politician and was going to rallies and other events in my spare time. Me and my friends were having a ball and loved being involved. One particular rally I went to was in the city. My friends and I took a train in and enjoyed ourselves. On the way home back to our university, I noticed a guy sitting across from us that I had recognized from campus. He was pretty cute, and I remember seeing him around as we must have had some mutual friends. I said hi to him, and to my delight, he also recognized me. We spoke for a few minutes and discovered we were both at the same rally. By the end of the train ride, he asked me for my phone number. I remember thinking, wow, a cute guy, and we have some things in common. I gave him my number, but didn't think much past that. About a week later, I received a text from him. He asks me if I'm free this weekend, and if I would be interested in meeting up and having a drink. This particular time was during a break from school, so not many people were around. For whatever reason, I had chose not to go home. In my naive mind at the time, I thought, great, I have my place all to myself. I meet him at our local bar and we have a few drinks. It was pretty quiet for a Friday as it was break time and after an hour or two decided to leave. I invited him back to my place for a bottle of wine and hang out some more. He wound up staying the night and leaving in the morning. But when I woke up, for whatever reason, I had an uneasy feeling. Nothing bad happened per se. I just didn't like how things had went. I felt like he was so serious not laughing or smiling the entire evening. Although he always had a drink in his hand, I realized he wasn't really drinking them. The entire evening, he was kind of shifty and nervous. The only way I can describe it is like he was on a mission and waiting for something. These were all red flags to me. I felt bad, but I just was not interested in the guy. To my relief, he didn't text me for a while after that, and I assumed he came to the same realization that it just wasn't a good match. That is, until about two to three weeks later. He writes me a message telling me that he's been busy, but really wants to meet up this weekend and catch up. This particular weekend, my older sister was having a large party for her husband's birthday at their house a few towns away. A few of my friends and I were going, and there was always a very large group of people at their parties, about 50 to 60. 
Now, let me be clear. These parties were not your typical get-wasted-and-stay-up-till-the-cops-get-called type college parties. They were more of an adult type party, given my sister's husband is fairly older than us. Don't get me wrong. There was plenty of drinking going on, and they were very fun. Just more of an adult type barbecue with day drinking. Me and my two girlfriends were going to spend the night as I was going to drive there, but obviously we would be drinking. The party started early at 12 p.m. Against my better judgment, I invited him to the party thinking it couldn't hurt. I gave him the address and time. He seemed very interested and agreed to come. The day of the party was so fun and my friends and I were having a blast. I must admit, I did have a sinking feeling and was not looking forward to seeing the guy. Then, to my absolute and utter relief, I get a text from him saying he will be unable to make it. I can finally relax and enjoy the party. By about 12 a.m., everyone is exhausted from a day of full-on drinking and the party is winding down. Most of all the guests have gone home except my friends and I and a few other guys, friends of my sister's husband who are also sleeping there, and of course, my sister and her husband. My sister has one guest room which was taken and a fully carpeted and finished basement. We had various blankets and pillows and we were all going down to sleep there on the couches or pretty much anywhere you could lay. As I'm about to go down to the basement and get ready for sleep, the man walks through the front door. No knocking, no text, no anything, just confidently walks straight in the house. I don't know why, but my initial reaction was fear. I pretended to be happy to see him and gave him a small hug. I asked him why he was there, to which he never gave a real response. All of the lights were out and everyone was gone. I was gesturing around and hinting at him that the party was over and that he had missed it. I felt bad that he had made the effort and decided to speak with him for a few minutes before I went to bed. We talked. I told him I was going to get ready for bed and that I'm sorry he missed the party. He says, yeah, that's fine. This dude is just not getting the hint to leave. I leave the room and go to change my clothes and set myself up a bed, brush my teeth, etc. I'm just hoping that he will leave, but I don't hear any movement from the other room. When I come back to the living room to check to see if he's actually still there, he is. And he is asleep on the couch. I obviously found this strange, but just assumed it was late and that he must have been really tired. He didn't seem out of place as there were various other people sleeping at the house as well. I went to the basement and found myself a place to sleep on the floor. About 30 minutes to an hour later, I'm lying on the floor, still awake, thinking about how weird it is that he showed up. It's pitch black, and there are a few other people sleeping there, including my friends. I hear someone in the dark slowly coming down the stairs. I see they are holding a cell phone light to guide them. As the figure reached the bottom of the steps, I see that it's him. Now, he has never been to this house that is in a nice suburban area, not a frat house. And I did immediately think it's weird that he would randomly be walking through a house of a person he doesn't know. I pretended to be asleep. As I lay there frozen, I suddenly feel a tap on my shoulder. He doesn't say a word. He is over me and trying to wake me up. I don't move and pretend to be asleep. I lay there in the dark silence and am listening for his footsteps to walk away. I can tell he is holding a light over me. Then, with no warning, this man takes a step back and with his boot on, kicks me full force in the face. I'm not talking about a little tap with his foot to wake me. No, full force boot kicks me directly in the face. My face goes numb. I don't know what just happened. I can feel blood running down my nose. I open my eyes and look at him and all I can remember saying is something like, why did you do that? He just stared at me blankly and said nothing turned around and walked back up the steps. I lay there, paralyzed in fear. My heart is beating a million times a minute. I don't know how long it was until I garnished the courage to get up, but eventually I army crawl in the dark over to my friend. Another man near her wakes up as well, and I explain what happened. We're all half drunk, dazed, and confused to say the least. I can't stay in this basement. I know he left, but I was so scared. My friend and the other guy offered to take me upstairs so I can sleep in my sister's room. I go into my sister's room and lay next to her bed on the floor. I shut the door behind me 
but unfortunately, there was no lock. I don't know how, but eventually I fall asleep. At some point, it's now morning, I wake up to my sister leaning over me. She asks, what happened to your face and why are you in my room? Right as I'm about to answer her, my friend who helped me the night before comes flying into the room. She tells us that the guy is still there and asleep on the couch. She runs out and I can hear her screaming at him to get up and get out. I hear him arguing back and asking where I am. My friend tells him I've left and he begins arguing that he knows that my car is still here. I have no idea how he knew which car was mine as he had never seen it before and that I hadn't taken my purse. Eventually, he leaves. After that night, he wrote me a message a few days later as if nothing had happened asking me to hang out again. I blocked him and have never heard from him again after that. I graduated only two months later and thankfully never even saw him on campus again. To this day, I have no idea why he kicked me in the face and how he has the balls to stay after that. I have learned my lesson about giving out my phone number. Creepy basement kicker. Let's not meet. This happened in May 2007, and for reference, I'm female, was 20 at the time, and weighed about 115 pounds, so overpowering me would have been extremely easy. I live in a city in Northern Ireland, and at the time, I was best friends with my ex-boyfriend. My ex-boyfriend's cousin's band decided to play a small gig way out in the countryside, so we had to drive for about an hour or more to get to the location. We arrived, and it was literally a field amongst fields, smack back in the back arse of nowhere. Apparently, one of the members of the band knew the owner of this field, and apparently we had permission to be there. I never checked, so I don't know, but whatever. There were several cars already there when we arrived. Me, my ex, his sister, and two friends travelled together. We had packed the car full of tents, sleeping bags, and a ton of alcohol. The plan was to watch the band, then blast some tunes, have a bit of a party, and spend the night in the field in our tents. The way the field was laid out was kind of in an L shape. All the tents were set up around the corner, and the band had set up a generator across the field on the other side. Then beside where the tents were, there was a hole in a bush to the other field. We went through here to go to the toilet, so we had some privacy from everyone. There was roughly 30 to 40 people in the field, and the band started playing. We started drinking and generally having a great time. Any time I needed to pee, I went with my ex's sister or a friend, as it was a good few minutes' walk to the next field, and none of us wanted to go alone, even though we were in the middle of nowhere. I was sharing a tent with my ex for the night, and at about 3am, I decided I'd had enough and wanted to go back to the tent to sleep. I told him I was going and made my journey across the field to the tents. As I got into the tent and pulled the zipper down, I felt someone tugging at it and assumed it was my ex, until I heard an unfamiliar voice say, let me in, quite aggressively. I called out, who are you? And he said, I know you're alone in there. You can't hold the zipper down forever. Let me in. Over the next minute or so, I was gripping onto the zipper of the tent and holding both sides of the fabric together to prevent this guy from getting into my tent. A couple of times, he managed to get the zipper up a bit, but I always managed to get it back down. For the life of me, I have no idea how I managed to do this. The whole time we were struggling against each other over the zipper, he kept saying things like, I'm going to get in eventually, bitch, and... It's going to be worse if you don't fucking let me in. I was absolutely petrified. Then I heard my ex-boyfriend's booming voice shout, What the fuck are you doing at that tent? Then I heard a smack and a thud, and my ex called to ask me if I was okay. My ex had saw what was happening, punched the guy, and he fell. He had watched me walk to the tents and watched this dude follow behind, assuming he was going to the loo, but he kept watching him to make sure. When he saw him turn towards the tents, he came over to make sure I was okay. Thank God he did. Anyway, a huge fight broke out, and then 
one of the creepy guy's friends ended up hitting him too. <laughs> Turns out, he was known for this kind of creepy behaviour and had been in trouble with the law for sexually harassing women in the past. And my ex's cousin had said that he was staying over at her house with her brother one night and she woke up to find him standing in her room watching her sleep. I really don't know what his intentions were had he managed to fight his way into the tent that night. No one would have heard anything as the music was so loud, but thank goodness my ex still cared enough about me to keep an eye on me as I made my way back to the tent that night. My ex actually bumped into the guy a few weeks later and told me that his lip was still pretty busted up and looked like he was going to have a permanent scar from the two punches. <laughs> This story has a lot of buildup, so I met this friend online the summer before my junior year of high school. I was 16. His name was Flip. We clicked pretty instantly. Our senses of humor matched up, and I felt like we were really good friends. He was a guy, I was a girl, but I never really held romantic feelings. Also, I was in a relationship. When I was 16, he was 19. I could tell he had romantic feelings and he let me know six months into our friendship that he loved me. We didn't really have a stable friendship as he flipped out a lot and would go extended amounts of time without talking to me. He told me it was because he couldn't bear to talk to me knowing we can't be together because I was dating someone. But I now know that it was more of a control thing and he wanted to stop talking to me to make me feel like I'm missing something. He really hated women really, really disliked women and felt like most are just whores. He told me he felt like I was different, that I was the only true woman he's ever met. Really red flag shit. I was young and didn't really think much of it. Our friendship was only online, iMessaging and FaceTiming. Now, when he went on these tangents where he would abruptly stop talking to me, he would go on Twitter and make offensive, demonizing tweets about me to people. Like, awful stuff. When he came back, I just ignored that stuff because he would just go back to being funny and nice. I'm building up to our IRL meeting, hang in there with me. So, he also had a habit of lashing out at people, taking revenge on people, and just making people feel like shit for fun. Another red flag but I thought I was special and that he really cared about me and would never do anything like that to me. I remember leading up to my 18th birthday, him being 21 now, he said to me, when you're 18, you're sending me nudes. You don't get to say no. I brushed it off because I knew I wouldn't. But yeah, notice there's just this element of him wanting to dominate. Anyway, fast forward two years later, I'm now 18, freshman in college. In October, I broke up with my boyfriend, same guy as age 16, and Flip took that as an opportunity. He would tell me he couldn't bear not seeing me, and that basically we have to meet or it's all over. Now, I didn't really have romantic feelings for him. My love for him was platonic, but I figured like, I'll try the romance. I'll try to love him romantically. I couldn't lose him so I impulsively bought a plane ticket to where he lives in December. My parents had no idea, and to this day still don't. I was going to go away on a Friday, come back on a Monday. The college I go to is in a city with an airport, so it was easy to just Uber to the airport. This romance that I'm trying to project feels real, and I genuinely felt like I loved him romantically. I was finally going to meet the guy I loved. Now leading up to the flight, about one to two weeks before, I started getting cold feet. I was questioning the legitimacy of my feelings and started getting on with a guy in a neighboring uni. I started catching feelings for him and kissed him a day before my flight. At that point, I had already decided I didn't want to pursue Flip romantically and I figured, hey, we've been friends for two years. When I get there, I'll tell him I only want to stay friends. Yeah, he'll be upset, but I'm sure our friendship is worth more than that and we'll be able to have a nice, enjoyable time together. How naive I was. I decided to go on the trip anyway, thinking that maybe seeing him would reignite that fire. Upon arrival, I realized that I did not love him, and I was no longer attracted to him. Regardless, though, he was a close friend of mine for a very long time, 
and whether I felt a romantic connection or not, I wanted to meet him for the sake of meeting him, just how I would want to meet any internet friend. So it's time for the flight. It's very early. I remember sitting on the plane contemplating walking out. I really just wanted to leave and not return. I should have listened to my gut. I arrive, and I go outside of the terminal. I see him, sitting in his car, just staring at me, like a very malicious, piercing stare. After a few moments, he gets out of the car. He looks different. It's strange, because we have FaceTimed, and I have seen pictures of him, but he just looks different. Kind of creepier. We hug and sit in the car. It's awkward. I feel awkward. We make small talk and awkward jokes, and in that moment, I wanted to be back in my dorm. We go back to his apartment, and we go up to his room. We smoke some weed, and I lay down on his bed to sleep. When I wake up, he's spooning me and trying to fondle me. I take his hands off and tell him to stop. Then I sit up and basically unload about how I don't want him romantically, only as a friend. He just started crying and begging me to tell him I love him. I tell him I can't do that. He then stands up, drops crying, goes into the bathroom and starts lighting stuff on fire. It smells like burning paper in the bedroom now. He comes out normally and just sits on his computer and plays games without talking to me. Now the rest of the trip is just like a combination of him being kind and normal to him being completely evil. Here's some of the things he's done and said throughout the three days. He made jokes about me dying would pretend to hit me and lunge at me and get close enough and I watched and I flinched. Told me he almost sent a snap of me to my mom with the geotag of this town so I would get in trouble. Told me he almost made me sleep in the car one night. Told me that one night while I was sleeping he walked over to me and just started farting on me. This one's just fucking nasty. Kept telling me to shut the fuck up when I would speak or ask questions. Did it multiple times in front of his roommates too. He was trying to feel me up in bed, and I kept pushing his hands away, and he would keep trying and would say things like, I know you want it, you're just holding back. Was calling me an idiot when I would ask questions. Served me spaghetti and told me he purposely used the moldy spaghetti sauce, hoping that I would get sick. Told me he was going to make me miss my flight home. Said he was planning to drive in the opposite direction of the airport and dropping me off in the middle of nowhere. So basically, I kept my cool. And when he would tell me these things, I would nod and agree and laugh with him. I was scared shitless and I wanted nothing more than to leave. So I kind of keep it cool and I spend my time trying not to upset him. Monday rolls around and my flight isn't until 8pm. Around 11am, he goes downstairs to leave and in that time I pack my bag and leave without him knowing. My plan of action is to run to the nearest shopping plaza and Uber to the airport from there. I wasn't about to Uber from his house. I'm almost to the end of the street, feeling free, when I feel two arms come up from behind me and wrap around me. He's hugging me, mumbles something into my ear, and then turns around and dead on sprints back down the street to his apartment. I ran to the shopping plaza, called an Uber and got in it. I felt so much relief in that moment. I felt like I was free. I waited at the airport with nothing to do for eight hours but it was better than being in there. I look back and I feel like an idiot, like I should have gone to a hotel and should have probably left, but I'm a broke college kid and I was already scared shitless being here without my parents' knowledge. After I left, I blocked him on every social media outlet I have, including LinkedIn. <laughs> he still has tried to contact me regularly for four months, but luckily I never told him my address or anything. So online friend of two years, let's not meet again. A few months ago, my sister talking to a boy online named Ben. The two of them had a lot in common and were only about a year apart in terms of their ages. We didn't think anything of it at first because it's normal to have online friends these days. My sister is really introverted, so it was nice to hear that she had someone she could chat to. From what I understand, Ben was also there for her emotionally too, if that makes sense. My sister became quite attached to him. Ben also introduced her to a few friends of his as well. They all seemed like your typical edgy teenagers, the kind that post selfies with emo song lyrics and stuff like that, similar to what she posts basically. 
Ben seemed like a normal, caring friend and even messaged me a couple of times when he was concerned about my sister being upset. He seemed genuine and I was happy my sister had found someone like this. One day, my sister asked my mom if she could meet up with Ben in the city. He lived in another state and had organized to spend a week in our state with his aunt, so it seemed like the perfect opportunity for the two of them to meet up. They arranged a date and time to meet in the city, and my mom and I accompanied her. When that day came, though, he didn't even show up. He made some excuse that his aunt wasn't driving him there, and we figured she was probably concerned about Ben meeting someone he only knows over the internet. I'll admit, I did have a really bad feeling about their meetup while we waited for Ben to show, but I stupidly ignored it. My sister, understandably, was quite upset that he hadn't shown up. Ben messaged me to apologize to us for having to run around after him. He explained his aunt can be unreasonable at times. At that moment, I genuinely believed he was a decent person and wasn't lying about his situation. A couple months passed with just the two of them chatting away like normal. At some point, my mom gets the idea that she and my sister could fly to his state and meet him, and his mom, in case she worried. Ben liked that idea, and so they ordered the flight tickets. One day, out of the blue, my sister burst into my room, clearly frightened. She told me to block Ben and the two friends he'd introduced her to earlier. When I asked why, she explained to me that Ben had been a cover-up identity for a person that had previously threatened her using another account. All the pictures he posted were from someone else's account. She found this out and confronted him. His two friends, that he chatted with on his posts and everything, were all fake accounts run by him to keep up the illusion. The person, after being confronted by my sister, admitted they were keeping tabs on my sister. They had been chatting for months and she had likely told him some personal things too. The flights were immediately cancelled after my mom found out and we were all spooked about the whole thing. I still am and I'm even a little paranoid about sharing this here. We couldn't tell the police because my sister was a dingus and didn't keep a copy of the messages the account sent her. The account was taken down after we informed the guy whose pictures were stolen about the incident. So, to whomever this person is, let's never cross paths again. So, when I was about 15 or so, I would always go grocery shopping with my mom. This time, she didn't just need groceries, but some other things that weren't super close by. We lived out in the country and the closest town didn't have what she needed. So we went to the bigger town or city about an hour away. Our last stop was the grocery store. As my mom didn't want to leave a bunch of groceries in the car on a hot summer day while she got whatever else she needed. While we were there, I noticed an older man, tall, skinny, semi-ill looking, that was paying a lot of attention to us or me. I also caught him talking to himself a lot. I almost ran into him when we were switching aisles and I said sorry. And since then, I had seen him like five times. And every time, I felt a shudder. And I'd look around and he would be somewhere staring at me. I told my mom and she said we were almost done. A few minutes later, we got distracted talking about ice cream. I was telling her about this ice cream brand that my brother, who's a health nut, told me about, and that it was supposed to be a lot better for you than well-known named brands. We started searching for it. I was on one end of the aisle and she was on the other. I ended up finding it and reached into the freezer to grab it. When I turned around, the old man was right behind me, like way too close. I could feel his breath on my face. He said something like, You're too pretty to be eating that. It'll rot your teeth. And I freaked. I pushed past him and ran back over to my mom and said, Found it! Let's go! And she saw the look on my face and looked past me and saw the man. We headed quickly for the registers and, unfortunately, we had a lot of groceries and the old man got in the line next to us and only had a few things. He kept talking to himself. I was keeping a very close eye on him and was relieved when he exited the store. But unfortunately, that wasn't the end of it. When we left the store, I noticed him sitting in his car outside the doors. He sat there and watched us put the groceries in the car and got behind us as we went to go leave the parking lot. I was freaked out. My mom told me it would be okay and that 
She was right there with me. We ended up taking some back roads home. My mom thought maybe he would get lost. As I said, we were about an hour away from home and the back roads made it even longer. We were about five to ten minutes away from home and he was still following us. When I asked my mom if I should call the cops, she said, no, call your dad and tell him what's going on. Tell him to be waiting outside with a shotgun. So I called my dad and told him what was happening and he had an idea. Since we live way out in the country, my parents' neighbor was about one quarter to one half mile down the road from us. They had a long driveway that you can't see their house from the road. He told me to have my mom go there instead so that the guy wouldn't know where we lived. My dad got there first, told the neighbor what was going on, and they both grabbed their shotguns and waited outside for us to pull up. The guy followed us down the long dirt driveway, and as soon as he got to the clearing with the house and saw my dad and our neighbor with their guns out, he threw his car into reverse and hightailed it out of there. I had already memorized the license plate number and told my dad that after we got home, he gave the plate number to the cops. Not sure what came of it after that. When I was in 8th to 10th grade, I was extremely involved in this small building server. The average age was probably 15 to 17, and I joined a group of builders and Skyped with them every weekend for hours. We all became close fast and trusted each other enough that we followed each other on Instagram. I became particularly close with one of the builders in my friend group named Peter. Peter was in the same grade as me, and we ended up texting quite a lot. I heard rumors that Peter might have a crush on me. He denied them, which I found laughable because it was the internet and brushed it off. Everything was fine for a while until something began to feel off when I talked to him. I was starting to constantly catch him telling small lies. This bothered me, so I figured it was time to distance myself from Peter and stop talking to him. Cut to a few months later of no contact, and Peter out of the blue texts me that he is going to be possibly transferring to my high school so he can get in-state tuition for college. Peter's plan is to somehow live completely alone and support himself while in high school. My stomach drops when I read the text, and I know this feels very, very off. I try to be calm, and I tell him that his plan is crazy. I tell him that it's oddly convenient that he chose my random suburb. Peter insists that his plan will work, and it's just a coincidence that he is going to my high school. I'm trying to call Peter's bluff and hoping he is just screwing with me because I cut him off. Peter says he bought the plane tickets already and he is going to stay in my town and to visit some high school in the area. Fear washes over me and I realize Peter definitely has some very unhealthy attachment to me. Peter was not bluffing. To my horror, he posts a picture on Snapchat at the airport. Peter asks to meet up while he's there and I of course decline. Later. I see on his Snapchat story that he is taking a tour of my high school. Peter is taking lots of videos and pictures probably hoping that I can see. Luckily I am stuck at home with pneumonia. I spend the next few days on edge and afraid he was going to ring my doorbell at any moment. Luckily he was not smart enough to find where I live and he flies home and does not follow his plan. The baffling part was none of my old group on the Minecraft server thought he was doing anything creepy. I felt like I was going crazy for thinking this was weird. I thought my rejection for this meetup and continued no contact would be the end of it, but about two years later and I just committed to my dream college, I still, stupidly, followed Peter on social media because I wanted some warning if he came to my area. Once again, Peter did. I see him posing in front of the library at my college with a caption saying, transferring here is definitely the move. Cut to a few months later, Peter finds out I had a boyfriend and directly contacts me for the first time in two years. He starts asking strange questions like, will he protect you? I shouldn't have answered but for some reason I did. I finally blocked him and stopped following him on social media out of fear. He has not tried to contact me since. Definitely made some mistakes because I was young and scared 
and had others telling me it was not a big deal. So Peter, let's not meet. I was 20 at the time, and single and ready to mingle. I was studying at a school about 28 minutes away from my house, and of course, I was on Tinder. Now I have dated some older men, I'm attracted to them, so my setting on Tinder for males was always ages 25 to 40. I swiped right on a guy who looked decent enough, and he was 36. We match, and he begins to message me. We go through a day or two of messaging. I explain that I'm really just looking for a fuck buddy, and he had his own apartment, about a two-minute walk from my school. Perfect. We add each other on Snapchat and Insta, and once he takes a look through all my pictures, his way of messaging becomes strange. He starts to message me stuff on Snapchat like, You're so beautiful, I want to hold you in my arms. You're like an angel. Now, mind you, we have never met. Once he starts messaging me like this, I realize that he's not my type, especially in a FWB situation. I don't need someone like that. I start to leave him on read, and I ignore his messages. The next weekend, I was going to a wedding. I was all dressed up, and of course, I posted a few pictures to my story, which he immediately started commenting on like, OMG, you're beautiful. I miss your touch. I want to feel you in my arms. I ignore him and have a good time at the wedding, and right before the wedding started, I popped an edible. By the time I got home, it was midnight, and I was very, very high and very sleepy. I had worked earlier that day and hadn't napped in between. I get into bed and start to go through my phone. I live with my family and everyone was asleep. I start getting messages from this guy again and I'm so high and tired that I start reading them, giving brief responses saying, aw, thanks. Then he messaged me saying, I think I'm going to come to tonight. I respond by saying, LOL, that's weird, don't do that, obviously thinking that he is joking. Then he says, I want to breathe the same air as you. I want to feel you. I want to breathe with you. I begin to freak out, and then he starts messaging me, be there soon, babe. I'm like super scared now, because I live with my family, and I didn't want anything weird happening. Then all of a sudden, I remember that my snap map location is on. I go into my map and I see my little bitmoji in her cute outfit sitting at my house. I quickly turn myself onto ghost mode, then I see his little bitmoji and it's getting closer and closer to my city. I somehow convince myself that he's joking. He's probably on his way to another city near mine, but he's getting closer and closer. It's 1.30 in the morning now. For the first time in years, I begin to pray. Ten minutes later, I check the snap map again. Now, even if you are in ghost mode, you can see if you are sharing locations with someone, although the other person can't. When I looked at my map, I was sharing location with him. He was right outside my house. I looked out my window and there was a car with its lights on. At this point, I am so freaked out. My heart is inside my throat, my anxiety is through the roof, and I'm still high. I end up passing out and then falling asleep. I wake up in the morning, scared. I check my phone. He had sent a few messages saying, You have a beautiful street, baby. A beautiful home. Have a good night, baby. I go into my mom's room to ensure that nothing had happened, and she was fine. I later went to work, and after work I went to the police station and spoke to them. They said they couldn't do anything unless he tried to come over again, and that's when I would call the police. I went home, and for a few days I got no messages. And then, at 5 a.m. on the following Tuesday, I got a message. Even though I drove all the way to your home to breathe the same air as you, you still have not messaged me. I am not as desperate as I seem. If you ever want this dick up until the balls, let me know. Since then, I've heard from him once or twice, but I eventually blocked him. I didn't block him from the start because he knew where my house was. I was scared that if he couldn't get a hold of me, he would show up. So creepy asshole who showed up at my house in the middle of the night. Let's not meet.